Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to D.G. Wills Books in La Jolla, California. Tonight, we're honored to have Professor Lawrence Krauss here to discuss his brilliant new book, Quantum Man, Richard Feynman's Life in Science. At this point, I'm happy to turn the proceedings over to Roger Bingham of the Science Network. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Um, great to be here. Um, actually, we were here uh, just a few weeks ago with, with Ramachandran, who's sitting here Probably. doing his book as well. Um, if you look at the Science Network's homepage, which is www.thesciencenetwork.org, you will see there's lots of things on there that actually have Lawrence Krauss in them. No. Uh, so you don't have to we, be here. We did a meeting recently called The Great Debate, Can Science Tell Us Right From Wrong in Arizona with, with, with Lawrence, Sam Harris, Pat Church, and Peter Singer, Steve Pinker, Simon Blankburn. And then we just did a re one recently, I'm looking at the homepage now, on, on what is life with Richard Dawkins and a few other people. Craig Venture. Again with Lawrence. So he's, as director of this Origins Initiative at ASU, Arizona State University, he's been doing amazing things. We're enjoying collaborating with him enormously. And he also came to the, the, the meetings that we did uh, called Beyond Belief. We've done Beyond Belief 1, 2, 3. And they were at the Salk Institute. And we talked about those sorts of issues about science, religion, reason, survival, and so on. So um, it's, it's great to have him here. Um, as he will tell you, um, he likes to be thought of as a public intellectual. <laughs> and Scientific American described him that way, and that's that's reasonable. I think that's a, I think that's a term of endearment, not a term of abuse. Yeah. Oh yeah, in and some people. Country, so, so <laughs> I'm I'm delighted that he's here. He's actually um, before before he was doing this, he was at Case Western University. I mean, you can look him up on Wikipedia, obviously. Um, uh, but the, the the important things that I like to point out are that he's actually now co-president of the board of sponsors of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists with my old friend Leon Levin. And in 2010, he was elected the board of directors of the Federation of American Scientists. So Lawrence, and the reason that I support him so much is that he does God's work. And I'm talking about Spinoza's God, Einstein's yeah. God, but he does God's work. Um, and I, I, I must read this out because you, you obviously Thank want you this God. to be known. Oh. Um, he's the only physicist ever to have been awarded the highest awards of all three major US physics societies, the American Physical Society, the American Association of Physics Teachers, and the American Institute of Physics. He's a great communicator of science. I think you're in for a wonderful evening. And I must tell you one last little story, which is the last time I saw a fine one. I went to a, a birthday party for somebody called John Lilly. Do you, any of you know John Lilly? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> um, dolphin work and so on. And I remember going into the house up in Decker Canyon in Malibu. and walking into the house, and Feynman was playing bongo. Sounds like it. <laughs> Feynman was playing bongos. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And John Lilly was walking around in a dressing gown, talking to the television set, because there were entities in the television set. <laughs> and that was when John was in his vitamin K, ketamine phase, and it was very interesting stuff. Um, but Lawrence will now regale you with some more, more stories about Richard Feynman. But m mostly about Richard's um, kind of scientific life. Um, this is another biography. It's a very interesting book. Uh, it I is a biography. It's just I enjoyed, I enjoyed in reading it enormously. So over to you. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you. Let's talk to okay. okay. One other thing, because, because it is being recorded by the Science Network, I, I need to say. Quick disclaimer, could you actually turn your cell phones off or put them on stun or something? And the other thing is if, you, if you're here with somebody you're not supposed to be with, or if you're r running away from the IRS, <laughs> now's a good time to look at <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, well, thanks, Roger. It's a, it, it is indeed a pleasure to work with Roger, and I'm glad this is, uh, and my friend John Booth, who's behind the camera as well, who's worked with us on many occasions now um, at the Origins Project at ASU. In fact, next week... Just so you know, I'll, I'll do an advertisement. If you want to drive up to Tempe next weekend, we have our, uh, an, a major event, a four-day event of celebrating science and culture, uh, which uh, the highlights of it will be on Saturday. They're, they're, we're going to have a performance of Holtz the Planets with images from NASA uh, narrated, it turns out, by me, and then a followed by a lecture by, by my friend Stephen Hawking, who will be there. And then, um, then on Sunday, we're, we're having uh, another friend of mine, and I know Rogers, Anthony Grayling, uh, coming in the morning to talk about his new secular Bible. And in the afternoon, uh, another friend, uh, Werner Herzog, will be there with his new 3D film, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. 
uh, which is a remarkable film, truly remarkable, and, uh, and, and we'll have a panel with Werner afterwards. And then on Monday, we're going to have a dance event with uh, the, the MacArthur Prize-winning choreographer Liz Lehrman called A Matter of Origins, which is an interactive dance event. So I recommend you consider a nice weekend in, in Arizona before it gets too hot and um, consider coming by to see those events. Anyway, enough for advertising. I wouldn't have done it if Roger put me in the mood. Um, okay, but this is not, is it, well, I was going to say it's not about me, but it's about Richard Feynman. But of course, as my, uh, if this is being recorded, I was going to say as my soon-to-be ex-wife, but she'll watch it, I know, anyway. Um, uh, it's always about you, Lawrence. And, um, and, uh, and it is. And so here is a, uh, a picture that some of you can see. Um, Richard Feynman has played an important role in my life for a long time, well before this. This is a, happens to be a picture that was taken uh, when I was an undergraduate. I'll talk about it a little bit. And I happened to actually have been talking physics with Richard Feynman at that time. But Richard Feynman um, came into my life as he does many physics physicists as a student. In fact, there's a, it's kind of interesting. I first heard of him when I was uh, at a summer science program and I was kind of bored. And the teacher saw me bored and he said, I, I want and remember this story because it's relevant because it's something very similar happened to Feynman. And he said, I, I can tell you're bored. I want to, I, here's a book by this guy, Richard Feynman. And it's really neat. He, he, he shows that antiparticles are particles going backwards in time. And he just won the Nobel Prize for this. And you should read it. So it was a book, a very famous book of his, which in fact is for sale here. I noticed right there. The Character of Physical Law, which was a, a transcription of lectures, the messenger lectures that he gave at Cornell. They're a beautiful volume and I highly recommend reading them. But at the time I read them and they, they inspired me. I didn't understand them. I found out my teacher didn't understand them either. He didn't quite get it right either, as I'll describe later. But uh, what they did for me was for the very first time make it clear to me that physics was kind of dynamic. It was actually alive. I learned physics and I learned about all the great scientists and I kind of figured it was done. And here was someone who I was told had just discovered these wonderful things about antiparticles. In fact, he discovered them 30 years earlier. But uh, it convinced me that maybe it was worth becoming a physicist. There was still something left to do. And um, then, of course, when I was an undergraduate, I did what every undergraduate does. I bought these books here, the Feynman Lectures on Physics, the Bible, the Red Book, also right there, I think. Is that those them? Yeah. And um, every, every student buys them, puts them in the room, doesn't understand them, <laughs> but, uh, and, and, uh, but periodically looks at them for inspiration. They were truly the first of their kind. It was a complete redoing of all of introductory physics, and not so introductory physics, from a completely different perspective, which was just, for, of course, typical of Feynman. And, um, and like many students, I kept them. And then when I was a graduate student, I began to understand them and uh, still have them and work with them today. But, but then when I was an undergraduate, I was fortunate enough to be involved in this association called, I grew up in Canada, called the Canadian Undergraduate Physics Association, which invited well-known scientists to come up and lecture to ostensibly the best undergraduates in Canada. And, we, and I was later president of that. Um, in fact, I got John Wheeler to come up. And, but, but this year, um, there was a very beautiful young woman who was president. And she somehow convinced Richard Feynman to come up. She actually, what she did, she actually flew down to Caltech and walked into his office unannounced. And, um, and lo and behold, Feynman showed up. And, um, and I got, at, this was after his lecture, but it turned out we spent the weekend together because um, I was there with my girlfriend, who was one of the only other women there. And uh, Feynman spent most of the time with us. And I'm happy to say, although I guess I was going to say I didn't want this broadcast, but, but uh, it's okay. No, it's okay. The message will get out. So Feynman taught me how to dance. And, um, uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, I can thank him for that. And so that was fine. And then I met Feynman. Well, I got to, when I went to, uh, I did my PhD at MIT. And when I was at Harvard after that, I, um, Feynman used to come to Boston periodically and lecture. But then once uh, I went to Caltech and gave a colloquium after I moved to Harvard, and Feynman was in the audience, which was fairly intimidating for a young person. Um, and, uh, although, and he asked an interesting question, uh, got right to the point. And then after the lecture, he came up. He wanted to talk more. And I was itching to tell him. I knew he, couldn't, he probably wouldn't remember me as this young student he'd met a bunch of years earlier up in Canada. And I wanted to tell him all about it. But this really annoying assistant professor, who I'm happy to say did not get tenure, uh, 
would not stop asking me questions and finally kept standing there so patiently and finally just gave up and walked off. And I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll get to tell him another time, but Feynman died shortly thereafter. So I never got to tell him that, which I've always regretted. And I, therefore, I was, but I was particularly happy when I was asked to write this book for this series called Great Discoveries. Because uh, first of all, I figured I could read all Feynman's papers. One thing that most people don't realize about physics and science is that you don't read the original papers. Uh, they're usually, so the great thing about science is it get re gets redefined and re-expressed in ways that are ever simpler. And it's often incomprehensible to read the original work. And, um, and like many people, I hadn't read Feynman's original papers. I'd read one or two. But I thought this would be an opportunity, it would be a motivation for me to actually read the papers, which is why I agreed to do it. But I also wanted to do it because there's been a lot of books, and many of them are here on this table, about Feynman the character and Feynman the prankster and Feynman the, 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 the joker, but not about Feynman the scientist. And Feynman was a scientist first and foremost. He may have been a joker, but when it came to science, he was deadly serious, as I'll describe. He, in a sense, became the conscience of physics. And I wanted to describe this, his science. And I thought, in fact, I could use his life, which is incredibly interesting, as a hook to explain the science, much like I, I wrote a book, The Physics of Star Trek, and I used Star Trek as a hook. Because people might not be motivated to learn the science, but if they learned it through Richard Feynman's life, they might. And in so doing, get an introduction to 20th and 21st century physics. Because as I'll describe, Feynman worked on things that eventually are the basis of everything we're working on now. So I'll give you, a, 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 I'll talk for a while, probably longer than I should, about some of these things. Um, and, um, and then I'm happy to answer questions. So here's Feynman as a little child. And, and when, you, when he was there, you probably would, when he was a kid, the question I, I asked myself first is, would, would you have known he was going to become one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century? And I think the answer is probably no. He was a pretty regular kid. He was like a, he was a smart Jewish kid from Long Island. Okay, and he did things. He had a chemistry set. He did some things that were kind of spectacular. He had this radio repair business. And Feynman was also, besides a scientist and a joker, he was a showman. And anyone who ever heard him lecture and saw him lecture realized what he, that he was a showman, or even when he was being interviewed. And I think it began very early. He had this radio repair business back in the days when radios were tubes. And, um, and he was famous because among the, in the neighborhood because he fixed radios by thinking about them which was his motto. So, and there's a very famous story told about this one time when this radio guy came in with this radio and plugged it in, and it just shrieked endlessly and disturbed everyone in the neighborhood. And Feynman paced back and forth for 10 minutes, thinking, and then went up and switched two of the, of the, of the uh, tubes in there and fixed it. Now, I am certain that he knew right away what the problem was. <laughs> but even as a 10-year-old, he knew how to play to the audience. And, uh, and, and that was one thing that was evident early on. The other thing that was evident early on, which is also not too often stressed about Feynman, is you, know, you get this idea that he just came up with these miraculous ideas and could solve any problem, which he could, but sort of on the spur of the moment. He liked to preserve that mythology, actually. But he was incredibly methodic in his working of science. He worked endlessly and rigorously and kept voluminous notes, thousands and thousands of pages of notes, but it began early on. As a 12 or 13 year old, he went to the library to get a book called Calculus for the Practical Man. And he had to tell the librarian it was for his father, because he didn't believe it was for him. But, and, and, and you know, you can see his notes here. You know, he, even as a 13 year old, his notes on Calculus for the Practical Man, rigorous, organized for himself on integral calculus, just to work through that, just characteristic of, of, of that. The fact that Feynman was able to work intensively on a problem, focus, endlessly until he solved it in an organized fashion or two key factors about the man that, that are not often appreciated. But what got Feynman interested in physics was an episode which was somewhat similar to the episode I described with myself, although I don't in any way intend to, to make any relationship between the two of us in that regard. He was born in high school and his teacher, Mr. Bader, came up and gave him uh, told, told him about something which he said he fell in love with and he remembered ever since. It was, um, it was actually called the principle of least action, but first there's, but to get there I want to describe something which is interesting called the principle of least time, which was something that was discovered by Fermat, a mathematician um, who's known for something else, 
for Fermat's last theorem, he scrawled a theorem in, 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 the, in the margin of a book and, and uh, became famous, not because he scrawled the theorem, but he scrawled the claim of a proof of a theorem that took 300 years for people to solve after that. But Fer Fermat actually did some things as well as make some claims. And one of the things he did was explain a, a property of something we teach and we bore students in physics class. We teach students, I don't because I find it boring, but we teach students um, optics and we teach them something called Snell's Law. It sounds boring already. <laughs> it's just the fact that light, when it, when, it, when it goes from one medium to another, bends. And it bends inward if it goes from air to water. And we can tell students, we can even give them the formulas for how much it bends, and they memorize it, and they think that's how physics is done. You just, you know, someone tells you something, def says it's right, don't ask me why, and memorize the formula, which is, of course, not how physics is done. Well, that's true. That's how light behaves. But, but, there's a, but you can understand this from another per, uh, perspective, which, in fact, Fermat showed, which is really amazing and far more interesting. That is, well, you can't quite see it that well with this, but imagine light when it leaves this laser wants to go from here across the street. Well, what it does is it thinks about what's, how, all the different paths it could take. And it chooses the path that takes the least time to get there. And that's the way it behaves. Now, of course, it, take, it goes in a straight line across the street because uh, there's just nothing but air between me and the street. But you see, if you have air and then water, the light travels faster through air than water. So if it took a straight line, it would travel longer in the water than, 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 it, than it might if instead it chose to spend more time in the air and then bend and then go all, as close as it can to vertical in the water. And you can calculate all the different paths that light will take. And you will find the path it takes, by Snell's law, is the path that takes the least time. So light figures it out and takes the path of least time. Well, it doesn't, but it behaves as if it does. And that's a fascinating thing. And one of the things I'm sure that fascinated Feynman about it is he was fascinated, as am I, by the fact that you can express many physical laws, ways that seem totally different, each one revealing something different about nature, yet they all were, uh, produce the same predictions. But this is an amazing fact. Now, in fact, in, in Arizona, if you drive there, you may see a, a, a mirage. And this effect is, is responsible for mirages, and I couldn't resist explaining mirages for those that have never seen them. So when you, a mirage, of course, when you look at the street, you, you look down at, at a hot highway way ahead of you, and you see what looks like a puddle. Or if you're in the desert walking, you see what looks like water. And the reason is, what's happening is the light comes from the sky where it's blue and comes down. And you might, it might just hit the ground, but it doesn't because they're, they're, if, in, if it's very hot, there are many layers of air above the ground. And at each layer, it bends. And it bends outward because the air is hottest near the ground and less dense. When it goes to, from more dense to less dense, it bends outward. And so it bends outward until it finally makes a return path and comes up to your eye. So you're looking down on the ground and you're seeing light that comes from the sky. That's how we normally explain it. But in fact, you can understand it using this principle of least time because the light has two choices. It can come from the sky directly to your eye, making a straight line through the air. But this air up here is cold and light travels slower in cold air. So what the light instead decides to do is go down and hang around as long as it can in the hot air and then come back up to your eye and that takes less time. So the principle of, of least time is why they're mirages. Now, Feynman was not told about the principle of least time by Mr. Bader. He was told about the principle of least action. The principle of least action sounds like a government agency or something, but, <laughs> but it, uh, it actually is something else. It's a little more complicated, but I'm going to show it to you because you're a sophisticated audience. I'll show it to you in, not in extreme, gener in extreme detail, but I want to actually show you the equation. First, I want to remind you of something that you may have learned in in high school. When I throw something up, it has two different kinds of energy. It has the energy of motion, something we call kinetic energy, which is always positive. It has a en potential energy, which is the energy it gets for the potential to do work. If I drop this on your head, it would do work on your head. So by lifting it up higher, it can do more work, and so it has potential energy. And, and it has the sum of these two things. Now it turns out, Newton told us how things move. But there's another way, completely different, that will tell us everything that Newton told us. If we just to say that when a particle takes a, goes from one place to another, it takes a path that minimizes the action. So there's kinetic and potential energy. And what is the action, the path it takes, some path, is determined by the sum over the path of the difference between the kinetic and the potential energy at every point. 
So a particle behaves, always tries to make sure its potential energy is as close as possible to its kinetic energy at any given point, and that's the path the particle will take. To minimize the difference of the two, that's called the action. And, it's a, and, it's, and the amazing thing is it's completely equivalent to Newton's laws, F equal ma and all the rest. So all you have to do is say a particle will go from here, a football, a baseball, will take a trajectory that every point minimizes the difference between its kinetic and potential energy. And that was the principle that Feynman said he fell in love with as in high school. It was amazed him about motion. Of course, he actually forgot about it pretty quickly. When he was in, in university, he entered MIT as an undergraduate, and, he, and, and, and one of his friends, uh, um, Welton, uh, basically said every time in class, mechanics classes that, that, that action and was mentioned, and this quantity here is called Lagrangian, was mentioned, Feynman would ignore it. He said, I, I just want to use Newton. I want forces. I want things I can understand. Things I can understand. So even if he fell in love with it, he certainly, it was a very fickle love because he, he, uh, he forgot about it very quickly. But he also fell in love with several other things. Let's see. Well, this is something else he fell in love with. It was, as he began to think about physics and learn the fundamentals of physics, a paradox arose. It's a paradox that was known since the time of Newton, almost. And in this case, it's, a, it's something called the self-energy of an electron. If I think of an electron as electric charge, a ball of electric charge, it has an electric field around it. Now let's think how you make an electron. Let's just imagine an electron as a ball of charge, and I put it together by bringing charge in from infinity. Well, I bring this one charge in, and then I bring a little more charge in, but as I bring it in, those charges repel each other. It takes energy to bring them together, and I bring another little bit of charge in, it takes more energy. Now it takes a finite amount of energy to bring all that charge together if the electron is a finite sized ball. But if the electron is a point particle, which is what we're told in classical physics, then it takes an infinite amount of energy to bring all that charge together, because all those negative charges repel one another. And so the, the, the electron should weigh an infinite amount. And this was a problem that had been around for hundreds of years, but it bothered Feynman as an undergraduate, which showed how, how deep his thinking was. Most, it's the kind of thing most people don't worry about as undergraduates. But it bothered him, and he wanted to solve that problem. And it was a, it was a problem he said he fell in love with and, and, and kept with him through, as you'll see, much of his life. He eventually won the Nobel Prize for solving the problem. Uh, he also did, fell in love with someone else, something else as an undergraduate. Um, his his uh, w wonderful wife, his first wife, who he knew, who he met as, um, as in a high school. In fact, before high school, he used to be a family friend. And... Uh, she was, and I can now say this because I know what it's like, she was everything he needed as a human being and as an intellect. She was the complement to him in every way. She was cultured, he was not. She was brave. Well, he was brave, but she encouraged him to be brave. In fact, the title of one of his books, sure, uh, uh, one, don't, Why Do You Care What Other People Think, is a famous sentence that she told him later on Actually, they still weren't married when he was in graduate school. He, um, he used to work for John Wheeler, as I'll talk about. And she gave him, she had a pet, pet name for him, Putsy, it was called. It was called. And, he, and she made him some pencils engraved, you know, I love you, Putsy. And she caught him one day scraping off the engraving because he was worried about Professor Wheeler seeing it. And she scolded him. She said, what do you care what other people think? And I think, you know, ultimately, that early love that he had for her that was validated I think it helped contribute to the courage that he had later on to always go his own way. It was a natural characteristic of his, but that support that she gave him at a crucial time in his life, because graduate school is a very insecure time for anyone who's been in graduate school, at least it was for me. And that, the fact that she gave him the, the, the courage to, and, and the confidence to go about his own work, I think was essential in forming the man that eventually became Richard Feynman. And, um, it was clear to everyone that by the time they were undergraduates, they would be married. And they decided before he went to graduate school that they would indeed get married, but not till after he got out of graduate school. And after MIT, well, he got actually an offer to mission to Harvard right away without applying because he finished first in something called the Putnam Examination, which is a national mathematics competition. If anyone's ever taken the Putnam Exam, you know it's impossible. Many people get no answers correct among the best mathematicians in the country. Feynman got not only number one in the country, but a score that was basically unheard of, which is another fact that people, and Feynman used to play it down. He was an incredible mathematician. His mathematical ability was almost unparalleled. He pretended often 
to not know mathematics in a way, but he was uh, an unbelievably skilled mathematician. But he didn't go to Harvard. He ended up going to um, Princeton. He almost didn't get into Princeton. Um, if you the the, the department uh, um, discussions about Feynman uh, consisted of three things. There was a departmental discussion. He took the exams to get in, and he scored the highest on the physics entrance exam that anyone in history had ever scored. He scored the lowest in English that anyone they'd ever uh, uh, considered admission of. And there was a big debate: should we let this guy in? And happily, happily they did. They also almost didn't let him in because he was Jewish. There was a quote on Jews. And if you read, the chairman of the physics department wrote uh, at Princeton wrote um, his professor at MIT just saying, just how Jewish is he? <laughs> Which is kind of amazing because Feynman, like most scientists, was an atheist. But it was just, uh, but in any case, happily, that nonsense didn't prevail. And Feynman made it to Princeton, where he um, was lucky enough to work with a young assistant professor, John Wheeler. John Wheeler is a delightful man. As I say, I got to know him as well. Uh, a gentleman, a true gentleman, but also brave in the extreme, and the most important thing, absolutely crazy. Just as crazy as Feynman. And that was the important thing, because neither of them were afraid of telling the other their crazy ideas. And that was very important. Because rather than say, that's crazy, I won't think about it, when one said to another crazy idea, they'd say, let's see how crazy it is. And Feynman had an idea that he told him as an undergraduate, he said, well, I can solve this problem of the self energy of the, energy of the electron if I just get rid of electric fields. Let's say electric fields are really, which were invented by Faraday, were, are just really not there. Let's say every electron in the universe interacts with every other electron without any fields in between. Its motion is determined by the motion of every other electron in nature. Now, normally, if you were to say that, say that there are no electric fields, when, of course, electric fields are the basis of modern physics, the professor would say, go home. But Wheeler didn't. Wheeler said, well, what would, the, what would be the implication if you got rid of the electric fields on electron? Is that possible? And he said, well, there's a problem. If electrons, if the motion of one electron is determined by the motion of, and the behavior of all other electrons in the universe, well, it takes time for this electron to know where the electro other electrons are. So as this electron moves, the force it feels will be delayed in time because all the other particles, it'll have to know where all the other particles in nature are. Well, you think that would be enough to kill the idea. But Wheeler said, no, well, that's a problem. But what if the interactions go backward in time? Well, then you, would, would it be able to work out? And, and, he, and he gave Feynman the problem and said, would this theory work if all electrons are affected by all other electrons and the interactions go sometimes forward and sometimes backward in time? And Feynman worked it out and found out if half the time the interactions go forward in time and half the time the interactions go backward in time, you could reproduce the results of electromagnetism without any fields just because of those charges. Now, that was interesting. But the, already, and this was in the, in the 1930s or, and, and early 40s, already by this time, of course, we knew that classical electromagnetism was not the relevant theory to describe nature because nature at its heart is quantum mechanical. And so if you really wanted to solve the problem of the, of the self-energy electron, you had to understand the quantum mechanics of this kind of situation. Now, this, uh, this fact that he had a crazy idea early on that, 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 that Wheeler didn't cut down, is, it, in no, Feynman's Nobel Prize speech, he said, an idea which looks completely paradoxical at first if analyzed to completion in all of its details and in experimental situations, may in fact not be paradoxical. The idea is don't give up on any idea until you can prove it's wrong. And try it in many different situations. It may be right in one, but don't give up there. Try it in lots of situations. If it fails in one, throw it out. But if it survives all of those tests, then maybe it makes sense, even if it doesn't make sense in your head. I was just having a debate with a theologian in North Carolina the day before yesterday which I don't want anyone to watch on, on, on the web because it's just so tedious, um, who was arguing that, you know, saying something was just like saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. I happen to have a T-shirt that says, which I happen to have on underneath my shirt at the time and I sh took off and showed, it says 2 plus 2 equals 5 in extremely, for extremely large values of 2. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, 
And it's true. And common sense, what we have as classical common sense often should fail us. And we can't be guided by classical common sense in the real world. We have to ask what determines what's sensible is not our minds, but nature. As Feynman repeated more and more often. Now, I want to talk about quantum mechanics for a few minutes. And because I want to show you what Feynman did. Feynman, Feynman's one of his greatest contributions to science is to completely redefine how we think of quantum mechanics and laid the basis for what eventually won him the Nobel Prize. But first I have to tell you a little bit about quantum mechanics. So I, I'll tell you one of the craziest things about quantum mechanics. So if I have a, an electron here or if I have a, a, a billiard ball and I, and I throw it at a wall with two holes in it and I have another screen like this screen here behind it, what will happen? Well, the ball can go through either these holes and I'll, I'll get these sort of dirt marks here and dirt marks there where the ball can hit. right? But if instead, so, let, so there you go, if instead I, ha, I don't take a ball but I, I have a wave, like a water wave, and I let it go through the same wall with these two holes in it, well the water wave goes through both holes and you'll find that the wave will interfere with itself, little, new little ripples will come along, and what you'll see are a series of lines called an interference pattern. If you've ever watched here, in the, if you watch the waves come in on a, cal a somewhat calm day, behind a rock, let's say, see two waves come in, you'll see they'll form beautiful patterns of ripples. We call them an interference pattern. What happens when you throw, a, not baseballs, but electrons at this? You throw electrons at this, this wall, and the electrons are particles, just like those balls, but what do you see when the electrons go through these slits? You see a pattern that looks identical to the pattern of those waves. Now, I'm not trying to argue that electrons are waves here. I'm trying to argue that this is crazy because electrons are particles. And you could say this is so crazy because what it means is the electron acts like it's going through both slits at the same time because that's what a wave does. But electrons are particles so it goes through one slit or another and I can prove it. I can shine a light on these slits and when each electron goes through I can say which slit did it go through and indeed if I do that and I send electrons in one by one and I shine a light on them each electron will be observed to go through only one slit or the other. And I can say, aha, I've proved it. The electron only went through one slit. But then I turn around and the pattern has changed. The pattern looks like this pattern with two, two spots, not a whole series of spots. So if I look at the electron during the process and determine which slit it goes through, the pattern is different than if I don't look at the electron. And what it means is when I'm not looking at the electron, the electron is going through both slits at the same time. And Feynman realized that, in fact, you can understand quantum mechanics in this way, and he needed to. He was at a beer party, this is a beer party, not the same one, in, in, in Nassau Hall in, at Princeton, and he was, he was asking, he, he realized he still wanted to solve this problem of self-energy electron using quantum mechanics, but he couldn't use quantum mechanics. Because the quantum mechanics of the day said, well, if you give me a, a system at one time, I can calculate its behavior at all later times. But in his, remember in his model, he had an electron and it depended on the motion of all electrons at all times. So he, he asked this German guy who was reading, he said, do you know of anyone who's ever formulated maybe quantum mechanics in a way that depends upon the paths of particles? And this guy, Herbert Yale, said, you know, I think this guy Dirac wrote a paper on this subject. And so they went together to the library, this is the, the physics library at, at Princeton, and they found Dirac's paper from 19, I think, 34, I can't remember. 32? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, where he had, in fact, argued that you might use the action principle to describe quantum mechanics. The famous action principle. The fact that, remember, classically, the action of a particle as it moves is a minimum in any trajectory. But he argued it, but he didn't prove it. And the interesting thing is Feynman was there with Yale, and they looked at it, and Feynman proceeded right, to, right then and there to work out a specific example and prove that it worked exactly. That the approximation or the, the inference that Dirac made in the paper was actually true explicitly. And, and, the, and Herbert Yelley said, boy, these Americans, they're always so practical. And, and, but it was amazing. Here was a graduate student that had just proved something that, in fact, had never been proved explicitly in the literature. And that was the beginning. 
Feynman had suddenly gone back to the action that he'd fallen in love with as a student and left behind because he needed it, not because he liked it, but he needed it to solve this problem of, of this theory of his and, 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 and Wheeler's. Now, the, one, the Feynman-Wheeler theory, which he wrote down, and he developed this quantum mechanics to explain, turned out to me not to be the right theory of nature. But the, but the picture of quantum mechanics that he established as part of it did. By the way, Dirac, here's a picture of Feynman and Dirac. Dirac was a hero of Feynman's, which is rather fascinating. because I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Dirac in a second, because no two physicists could ever be more different, which is another thing I like to stress. Everyone has a stereotype of scientists, and the stereotype is wrong because scientists come in all types. You know, some people think to be, mathematical, to be a theoretical physicist, you have to be a mathematical wizard. You don't always have to be. You have to be a nerd. You have to be inward. You have to be socially inept. You don't have to be any of those things. Some of my colleagues certainly are all of those things. But it takes all types. And here are the, were the two extremes, Feynman and Dirac. But Feynman realized you could understand quantum mechanics by literally saying that I could consider the path of an electron. Now, classically, I calculate the action of each path, and the electron takes only one path. But quantum mechanically, he said, I can calculate a probability that an electron will take a path based on its action, and a probability that it'll take another path based on its action. And in order to find the final probability of whether it's going to get up there, I have to consider all possible paths and add the action for all possible paths in an appropriate way. And when I do, I'll get the right answer. And that was Feynman's path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, which really now is the basis of our entire understanding of quantum mechanics. It's a, an intuitive way of understanding what happens. Instead of some miracle of calculating the Schrodinger equation or using matrices, here you can actually think about just looking at every single path. And you can even understand classically why, why a single path is chosen. And if I had more time, I'd explain it. And if during the question period, you can ask. But it, it's, it's a beautiful, intuitive picture, which is so typically Feynman. Now, OK. It was good enough for Feynman to get a degree. It wasn't good enough for him to do what he really wanted to do. It didn't solve the problem of the self-energy of the electron. It didn't solve the problem of the infinity. But Feynman graduated anyway, because something happened around the time he was graduating. Bohr came to Princeton and said, the Germans are working on an atomic bomb. He told it to Wheeler, who had worked with Bohr as a student. And Wheeler told others, and of course, as many of you know, Einstein wrote to Roosevelt and said, there's a potential of building a weapon of unprecedented destructive power, and the Germans may be working on it. We should work on it. And that thereby was created one of the most amazing projects, scientific projects, in American history. It still amazes me when I think of the Manhattan Project. It was three years from that letter to the time an atomic bomb was first exploded. Now, I'm not celebrating the atomic bomb. I don't by any means to. But if, if you think about this, in order to create an atomic bomb, you had to produce all these isotopes of uranium that didn't exist on Earth, at least in any abundance. One had to build a huge plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and then, I mean, and then determine what the f nuclear physics was of these things that weren't even known. I mean, nowadays, it would take more than three years to get the environmental permit to build the plant <laughs> in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But in, in three years, by mobilizing the best minds in the world that were available, the United States did that. And Feynman was one of the best minds. And it was the best possible thing that could have happened for Feynman and Arlene. Richard and Arlene got married just after he, he, he graduated, in spite of the objections of his parents, because Arlene had come down with tuberculosis. And Richard's mother, being a protective Jewish mother, was very concerned that this would that the, the dealing with a, a, a sick wife would get in the way of his career, and he wouldn't earn enough money to take care of her. And it's really, really heart-rendering to read the day they got married, he borrowed a car from a friend, put a mattress on the back of it because she could barely walk, brought her down to the Justice of the Peace near Princeton. They got married, and then he took her to a sanitarium for poor people and where she stayed. Now, if the war hadn't intervened, Feynman and Arlene would have, Feynman would have gotten a job as a professor somewhere, and they would have gone to a community and lived a, a standard boring professor's life. And, uh, um, and I think, in, I mean, the war was awful, but one of the nice things about the war was it changed their life. Because 
As I'll tell you, Robert Oppenheimer, who ran the project, was told about Feynman and invited Feynman to be part of the Manhattan Project. And this was an adventure. The two of them had never been West. And Arlene was nothing, even though she was ill, she just thought this was the greatest adventure. And she wrote some beautiful letters to Richard about what, how lucky they were to be able to go on a trip. And the two of them headed out to Los Alamos. Here's, here's Oppenheim with Leslie Groves at, uh, uh, at the site of the, of the Trinity explosion. Feynman was invited out. He got the very first long distance call of his life when, when uh, Oppenheimer called him and invited them in. He and Arlene took the train out on a wonderful, wonderful journey together, and it was great for them. Arlene died a month before the atomic bomb was, was the Trinity explosion. But I, their life was an adventure, and I, and I just am happy for the two of them that the last three years of her life, two and a half years of her life, was not spent in some boring place like Princeton. Uh, uh, for those who've been there, um, that they had that adventure that the two of them really wanted. And it was really difficult. She had to stay at a sanitarium, and the nearest sanitarium was 100 miles away. Oppenheimer had found it. He was wonderful that way. And every weekend, Feynman, who didn't have a car, would hitchhike 100 miles to spend the weekend with her and then hitchhike back. And, um, in fact, it was near the final days of the bomb when, when she was dying, and he hitchhiked down and got there in time to get there just before she died. And another typical Feynman story. I know I'm going too long, but I'm going to go up about five or ten more minutes. Um, well, maybe I'm not going too long. I don't care. I'm going to go as long as I go. Um, she died, and he was at her side, and, and then later on he got, took her clock, and her clock had stopped ticking the moment she died. Now, a lesser person would say, cosmic. There's something in the, in the air. It's meant to be. But Feynman sat down and thought, you know, the nurse probably picked up the clock to check it, to record the time of death, and it was an old clock and probably it stopped working when she picked it up. So even then, even in the moment when, he, when, when his, the greatest love of his life died, he refused to be confused by nonsense. And, and, and you know, he used to, this is a side I wouldn't tell, but, but I don't even know if it's in the book, but he used to, Feynman realized that the easiest person to fool is yourself. And, and that was incredibly important. And he, he had no tolerance for people who fooled themselves, especially experimentalists. He, uh, Fred Rhinus, who, who, who was a Nobel, later a Nobel Prize winning physicist, probably didn't get the Nobel Prize for an extra 10 years because he was performing an experiment on neutrinos and came up with a result which Feynman looked at and said, this is nonsense. I can prove it's nonsense. And at a public meeting, humiliated Rhinus. And I think it I probably did contribute to his being delaying, delaying getting the Nobel Prize. But, but, but Feynman used to go up to people and he'd say, you won't believe what happened to me today. You, you just won't believe what happened to me. And people say, what? And he'd say, absolutely nothing. <laughs> because people, you know, you have a dream. You have a million dreams that are nonsensical. And one night you dream that a friend is going to break their arm. The next day they break their leg. And you say, oh, I'm clairvoyant. But you don't remember that most of the time you dream nonsense. We all think everything that happens to us is significant. A lot of the time it's just an accident and coincidence. And you have to realize that you have to second guess yourself more than anyone else. An important characteristic. That was an aside, I, but I thought it was worth telling. Um, so anyway, Feynman was in, at Los Alamos, and, and his true skills in everything from theoretical physics to engineering to computers, which he became, began to fall in love with. He bit, built the first parallel processing computer in, in Los Alamos. It was parallel processing because he had all the, a lot of the spouses um, of physicists doing calculations in parallel with, pen, with pencils. And, um, and, and that's how they did them before they got the first computer. And, and they built a bomb that worked. And he worked under this man here, Hans Bethe, one of the truly great theoretical physicists of his time. Hans Bethe was the opposite of Feynman in the other way. Hans Bethe was unflappable, calm, and when he did calculations, he began here and ended here, and he was always right. And Feynman, of course, was impatient and tried to start there, go there, and then figure out what happened in the middle. And, uh, in fact, Murray Gell-Mann, who was uh, not only a colleague, a friend, and later on not so friendly to Feynman, um, used to say, here's how Feynman works. Get a problem, think really hard, write down the answer. <laughs> and Feynman often made it appear that way, but he, but he worked very hard. But, but Beta was the opposite. And the, and, and the two of them would argue, and people at Los Alamos called them the, the, um, the mosquito bo boat and the battleship. And you can, you can guess who was who. But Beta recognized talent, and Beta did something brilliant. Uh, I was chairman of a physics department for many years, and I know many things about recruiting people that are tricks. And Beta knew this. 
get them first. And so Beta, well before the end of the war, gave Feynman a job as an assistant professor at Cornell for whenever the war ended. And when, by the time the war ended, Feynman had become famous among the group at, at, at Los Alamos. He started as an unknown graduate student. By the time the war ended, all the best physics minds in the world knew that Feynman was brilliant. And offers started pouring in from around the country. But Feynman went to Cornell for two reasons. It was the first offer, and he loved Beta. And it was a great idea, because Beta was an amazing mentor for him. And he went to Cornell and had an awful time. Everything came apart. Because he was one of the first to leave Los Alamos. His wife had just died. His father died a month later. And like many of the physicists at the time, he finally began to think about what they'd just done. During the three years, they were so enamored with the technical problems that they didn't think about what they were doing. But he realized that they just built an atomic bomb. And he realized the United States wasn't going to be the only country with an atomic bomb. As he said, what one fool can do, another fool can do. And he realized the Soviet Union would build one in no time. And so when he looked around, he went to visit home in New York, and all he did was look at the buildings and think, these aren't going to be around very long. He just became uh, completely, um, um, what's the word I'm thinking about? He, he, he lost all faith and all hope, in a sense, in the future. Um, aimless, without hope. And, the, and at the same time, he'd suddenly begun life as a professor, which is very different. In Los Alamos, they were working urgently on problems which could be solved, they weren't fundamental problems, they were engineering problems. Moreover, you could test them the next day and implement them the day after that. Now he had to go back to problems where you could work on for 10 years and maybe make no progress. It's a very different life. It's also a different life because no one tells you how to be a professor. And for all of us who've made the transition, it's, it can be very depressing because you don't know what to do. And finally, the worst part was that he started getting offers like crazy when he was a professor. He didn't have a published paper. And he was offered tenure at the Institute of Advanced Study, at Princeton, everywhere around the world. And it made him feel worse. He felt like he was a fraud. And, and again, when I was writing this, again, I try, I'm not, please do not suggest that I'm, or think that I'm suggesting any parallels. But I could relate. Because I know how debilitating that can be. When I was a student, I was a student at MIT, unknown in a community full of very good people, in the Harvard and MIT and the whole region. And then I was lucky enough to get a, a very fancy position at Harvard. And all those same people who didn't know who I was the day before suddenly knew who I was. And I remember when I arrived at Harvard, I, you know, I was supposed to do something brilliant. And for six months, I couldn't lift up a pencil. I mean, I couldn't work because I felt like a fraud. And uh, in my case, it might have been true. But in Feynman's, it wasn't. But he felt like a fraud until finally one day he was in the cafeteria. He threw up a plate, or a student threw up a plate, and he watched it wobble. He said, I can explain that wobble. And he said, well, that's not an important problem. And he said, who the hell cares? It's fun. And once it started to be fun again, everything came back. And Feynman went back and was affected. And I'm just showing this picture. I'm not going to show it. It's atomic physics. An experiment had come along which shown that, showed that quantum mechanics was wrong. It was, it was something by an experimentalist called Willis Lamb. Quantum mechanics predicts the energy levels in atoms, which is what's so beautiful about it. But there was a certain energy level in hydrogen which wasn't right. And in fact, you had to alter the quantum mechanics of Schrodinger to include relativity. And the person who showed how to do that was Paul Dirac. Paul Dirac developed a relativistic theory of electro quantum theory of electromagnetism called quantum electrodynamics. Dirac wrote down an equation which we called the Dirac equation. And Feynman was forever jealous because Feynman always wanted an equation. And Dirac had his equation. Now, Dirac guessed the equation. Dirac, as I say, was an amazing guy who, who really did just think. In fact, there's, there's a story. He, he, spoke no, almost, he probably spoke 200 words in his entire life. And, uh, and when he first went to Copenhagen to work with Bohr, he'd come from Rutherford, from England, and Bohr wrote to Rutherford and said, who's this dodo you stuck us with? He just sits in the office. He doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't do anything. And Rutherford told him a story about a guy who goes into a parrot shop to buy a parrot. He said, I want to buy a parrot. He said, fine. Well, this parrot here is a pretty colorful parrot. It, uh, it's, and the guy says, how many words does it speak? He says, 10 words. How much is it? $500. Well, what about that scruffy parrot in the back there? Oh, don't worry about that parrot. OK, this, this parrot here is prettier. How many words does it speak? 50 words. How, how much expensive is it? $2,000. Whoa. Well, what, what about that scruffy bird in the back? How much is it? And the guy goes, $100,000. 
Guy goes, it's such a scruffy, ugly parrot. How many words does it speak? He goes, no, it doesn't speak. He goes, it's an ugly bird that doesn't speak. This bird is pretty and it speaks five words. It's, it's, it's $500. This other one speaks 20 words. It's $2,000. This one doesn't speak at all. It's $100,000. And the guy who owns the store goes, yeah, but that bird thinks. <laughs> okay. And that was Dirac. And Dirac thought and wrote down an equation. And the strange thing about this equation was that it predicted for every particle in nature, there was a particle that had the opposite charge and the same mass. Now, at the time, the only particles that were known were the electron and the proton. And the electron and the proton had equal and opposite mass. That was good. But the proton's 2,000 times heavier than the electron. So Dirac thought, well, maybe there's some mistake. And really, this equation describes the proton. Maybe everything is described here. And he really didn't believe that, that, it, that it worked. But in fact, two years after he wrote down the equation, Carl Anderson in California here, observing cosmic rays, discovered a particle that had the same charge the same mass as the electron, but the opposite charge. We, we now call it the antiparticle electron, the positron, won the Nobel Prize for it. And Dirac later on said, my equation was smarter than I was. Now, I was going to show you that Feynman was able to demonstrate, and I will if, the, if you have a question on it, but I don't, I want, I, I don't want to talk about too, uh, that much longer. He was able to show that you could understand antiparticles indeed as if they were particles going back in time. And not only could you understand them, but you could, they were required by his path integral picture of, of quantum mechanics in a very simple way. Very simply, you could show that if you had particles in relativity and quantum mechanics, you had to have antiparticles. It was obvious. And that allowed him to do a calculation of using quantum electrodynamics that no one had been able to do, incorporating relativity and antiparticles and getting the right answer for the, for the spectrum of hydrogen. And moreover, getting rid of all the infinities, including the self-energy of the electron that he had so worried about as an undergraduate. Not getting rid of all the infinities, but showing how you could ignore them and get the right answer. And it was an and, and, and by the way, this, he, Dirac was his hero, and Eugene Wigner, who, by the way, married Dirac's, uh, his sister married Dirac. And Dirac, by the way, when he used to introduce his wife, he'd say, this is Dirac, this is Wigner's sister says something. But anyway, um, uh, he, but Eugene Wigner said about Feynman, he's another Dirac, only this time human. Um, but anyway, the, th the moment, the moment that made it for Feynman was uh, two years later, after he'd finally written down his, his theory, when he went to an American Physical Society meeting, and this guy, uh, Murray Slotnick, was a, a, then a graduate student, had done a complicated calculation. And Robert Oppenheimer was chairing the session and just completely tore him apart and said, that's completely wrong. I have a student at Princeton who's got the opposite answer. And Feynman arrived at the meeting. People told him of this big controversy. And he went up to Slotnick and asked what theory he was working on. And that night, he, he performed a calculation and got the answer. And he came to talk to Slotnick about it, who was horrified. It had taken Slotnick three years <laughs> to calculate this, and he'd only been able to do a subset of what Feynman had been able to do in a single night. And Feynman realized, as he said, the minute he realized he could do in a single night what other physicists took three years to do and do in better generality, as he said, that's when I won my Nobel Prize. That's, when it, that's all that mattered to me. That's when I got the prize, the only prize that mattered, because I knew I'd been able to produce something that other people hadn't been able to do and that was going to be useful in the field. But he eventually did win the Nobel Prize for that many years later. But people didn't know about it. It took a long time for these weird path diagrams that he invented, which we now call Feynman diagrams, to be accepted. People didn't believe him because he couldn't explain it. For example, here's what he said. What I'm trying to do is to bring birth to clarity, which is really a half-acidly thought out pictorial semi-vision thing. <laughs> That's the kind of way he was talking at these meetings that people thought, this guy's crazy. He's brilliant, but why should we believe him? But eventually, he was able to show his, his equations were, um, his figures were, in fact, Freeman Dyson, who I was just happy enough to be with two nights ago in, in, in New York, showed the rest of the world that it worked. And eventually, now you cannot open a single issue of the physical review without seeing Feynman diagrams in every area of physics. His picture of quantum mechanics changed the way we think of the world. And if he'd stopped there, that would have been enough. But I'll spend five more minutes talking about the rest of his life. He moved out to Caltech to get away from Jerry Cornell and also to get away from a lot of women. During this time of feeling aimless and hopeless and really not caring about life, he had 
decided, that, and having lost his great love, he became quite a womanizer. He, he used to go to undergraduate parties. He looked very young. He used to go to undergraduate parties and pretend he was an undergraduate and seduce undergraduates, which used to be allowed. And, um, and then he, would, he, he left Cornell with at least two women who claimed they were pregnant by him. And he had to get out. And he went to, to uh, Caltech. And, um, and it was beautiful out there. And the best thing about Caltech, I remember they did this for me in Arizona. They said, come here, but don't, you don't have to come here. I remember the, when I went to Arizona, one of the nicest things, they said, come, we'll pay you, but you can do whatever you want for a couple of years. Go anywhere else. And, um, and uh, they said, don't go anywhere else. So where did Feynman go? Well, Rio de Janeiro. And he had an amazing time there. He learned Portuguese. He actually taught physics there. He also learned how to drum, as we've now heard the drums. This is, he got involved in street festivals, and, and he'd hated music as, as a child. But he, this is him right there in a street festival band in, in, in Rio. And, um, but eventually, he went back to Caltech. Oh, by the way, he, no, this is still in Rio. This is the, I went to visit Rio and took a picture of this hotel. This is where he stayed. He, he got the owner of the hotel to put him on the same floor as all the American Airlines stewardesses, <laughs> who he got to know very well. He was famous there. He also, he, and he was really just a completely a scoundrel. He, one of the favorite things he did was convince prostitutes to sleep with them and, 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 have, and, well, and have them basically pay for him. So it was, um, anyway, for what that's worth. But Feynman had done this, and he wanted to strike out. And, and he went, worked in lots of other areas. And I won't go into one of the next areas he described, a beautiful theory of, the, the theory of liquid helium, which involves superfluidity. Most of you have heard of superconductivity. Maybe you don't know about superfluidity. Liquid helium, when you cool it down cold enough, you, it won't stay in a beaker. It'll flow up around the edges. It, it'll, it'll flow through anything. A tiny crack, no matter how small, it'll flow through it. And no one had a theory of it. He later explained it. And, I, and if I had more time, I would go into it. But I certainly talk about it in the book. But the, one of the things that's really relevant for today that I did want to mention before I end is a famous paper he wrote in 1960. We said there's lots of room at the bottom. People are building machines at human scales. But there are all these scales much smaller. And maybe we can eventually build things at the quantum mechanical scale, where we can exploit quantum mechanics. And to get people interested, he gave a prize. This was in 1960, still before he won the Nobel Prize. Two $1,000 prizes he offered. One for the first person who could build a motor that was 1 64th of an inch on either side. And another for a person who could print an entire page of a book on a, on a small region 1 south thousandth of an inch across. He figured they'd never be done. Six months later, this guy showed up at his doorstep um, with a motor. Here it was. And Feynman was shocked and embarrassed. And if you read the letter he wrote to this guy, he said, you know, I didn't expect you to do it, but um, I'm, uh, I'm only, and he, and he didn't plan to pay the money, but he did. He said, but I'm only slightly disappointed that no major new techniques were needed to develop this um, method. I was sure I'd made it small enough that you wouldn't be able to do it, but you did. Now, don't start writing small. I don't intend to make good on the other one. <laughs> because I just got married and I bought a house. <laughs> 20 years later, a graduate student with photolithography did do it for the first time in Feynman. But then 1000 bucks wasn't so much, and Feynman did pay up. But he created the field in this process that we now call quantum computing. Generating engineering computers that are quantum mechanical, that have properties that are fascinating. And again, if I had more time, I'd go through them. But I, I'm not going to go through them. There are two areas I want to end with that he mentioned that mentions that are rather modern today. One is quantum gravity and the other is string theory. And I just want to, he, attended, he started to work on gravity and he attended a meeting and this was his impression of people working on quantum gravity. He wrote to his wife, he got married again and, and, and was married for the rest of his life. He wrote to Gwyneth and he said, I'm not getting anything out of this meeting. I can read it easier here. There are hosts of dopes here and it's not good for my blood pressure. Such inane things are said and seriously discussed, and I get into arguments outside of the formal sessions. Whenever anyone asks me a question or starts to tell me about his work, it's always either one, completely ununderstandable, two, vague and indefinite, three, something that's correct that is obvious and self-evident, worked out by a long and difficult analysis and presented as an important discovery, or four, a claim based on the stupidity of the author that some obvious and correct thing is accepted and checked for years is in fact false, these are the worst. No arguments will convince these people. Five, an attempt to do something probably impossible, certainly of no use, which is finally revealed to be wrong. Or five, six, just place wrong, plain wrong. 
This is a great, there's a great deal of activity in the field these days, but this activity is mainly in showing that the previous activity of somebody else resulted in an error or in nothing useful or in something promising. Remind me not to come to any more gravity conferences. And that was gravity at the time. It was, a, it was a field which until the work of Feynman, which led to the work of Stephen Hawking, really was separate from the rest of physics. But it also led ultimately through quantum gravity to string theory. And string, Feynman said this about string theory. Before he died, string theory had reached its prime and he said, I don't like that they're not calculating anything. I don't like that they don't check their ideas. I don't like that for anything that disagrees with an experiment, they cook up an explanation, a fix up to say, well, it might be true. For example, a theory requires 10 dimensions. Well, maybe there's a way of wrapping up six of the dimensions. Yes, it's all possible mathematically, but why not seven? When they write down their equations, the equation should decide how many of these things get wrapped up, not their desire to agree with experiment. In other words, there's no reason whatsoever in superstring theory that it isn't eight out of the 10 dimensions that get wrapped up and that the result is only two dimensions, which would be completely in disagreement with experience. So the fact that it might disagree with experience is very tenuous. It doesn't produce anything. It has to be excused most of the time. It just doesn't look right. And many of us sympathize with that. But five minute, as I am concluding now happily, as I show here, I mean, <laughs> Roger's getting antsy, I can see, um, uh, was involved in, in, in basically every area of modern physics that, that, it, that touches on what we're working on today. At the forefront sometimes, sometimes leading from the side, sometimes leading from the rear. But in every case, the work he worked on is at the heart of what we're talking about now. But for me, the greatest legacy of Feynman is the fact that he took science seriously, as I said at the beginning. And I want to end, if I can show this clip from Feynman. I hope the, the microphone will, will, will allow me to, you to hear this. Oh, well, uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to skip this. I'm going get, to get right to Feynman. Here we go. You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything, and there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask why we're here and what the question might mean. I might think about it a little bit. If I can't figure it out, then I go to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't, have to, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in a mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell, possibly. It doesn't frighten me. He wasn't frightened by anything. He was a brave man. It took a man like him, as I say, a man who would break all the rules to tame a theory that broke all the rules. Thank you. Two quick comments on that, um, for people who are interested. Um, there is, on the American Institute of Physics website, the Niels Bohr li Library and Archives, there is not 200 words by Paul Adrian, as Murray Gell-Mann would call it. Yeah. There's a long interview with Murray Gell-Mann on the Science Network website where he talks about Dirac at great length. But there's a long interview here, which you will like. There's a fortuity here, uh, in that um, there's an oral history transcript, uh, an interview by Paul with, with Dirac, by Tom Kuhn and Eugene Wigner. Well, it was brother in law, he probably talked. At talking. Wigner's home yeah. on April the 1st. Oh, perfect. 1962. Oh, perfect. So you love that? Yeah, I do. That's, That's great. One thing. The second thing is that um, uh, you, you, probably you, you, most of you know this, but the, um, at, at Feynman's blackboard at Caltech when he died, you, you know this, it had a, a number of statements on it. One of them said, What I cannot create, I do not understand. And the other said, know how to solve every problem that has been solved. So that notion of going back always and sub doing things from first principles was so Feynman-esque, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Let me make a comment on that, Roger. Roger knows this because he was at the meeting, I think, where we talked about this. That quote, what I cannot create, I do not understand, was so influential that Craig Venter, who was at our meeting on the origin of life, right. um, as you probably know, when he created this synthetic life form, he uh, embedded several quotations in it so he could prove his man. One of them was from Feynman, but he got the quote wrong. And in fact, the, the Feynman archive sent him the picture of the blackboard to see. So it's in there wrong. But what I love about it is that this thing is going to mutate, and eventually the quote will be right. Uh, 
the other the other thing that Lawrence, Lawrence has at the beginning of this book, the the, 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 the Franz piece quote is a, again a, a quintessential Feynman, just just so you know. Um, after the Challenger explosion and, and disaster, when he presented that critique of what had been done, he finished by saying, "Reality must take precedence over public relations, or nature cannot be fooled." Mm -hmm. That was again right up there too. Right? Mm -hmm. Great time and stuff. So yeah. So so um, let's let's see. If, are there any questions? I mean, let's let's try and find some. You've got your hand up. Let me come over here. I was reading a book I got here about Vladimir Nabokov, yeah. and it goes into enormous detail about how he suffered from synesthesia of time and space. And apparently it ran in the family, so it's not that uncommon. And I started immediately thinking about Feynman and Dirac and Einstein. In other words, all the things this gentleman here is talking about make perfect sense now, but I bet they were counterintuitive back in the early 20s when quantum physics first hit the, you know, these funny formulas yeah. with electrons going backward in time, Maybe somebody who had a little bit of that Nabokov synesthesia would have, wait a minute, this is not completely ridiculous. Let me think about this a little bit. Well, let me say, first of all, that they're counterintuitive today. They're still counterintuitive today, and they'll still be counterintuitive tomorrow. In fact, Feynman used to say, I don't understand quantum mechanics. In fact, he, act, he actually said, the reason I want to build a quantum computer is because maybe it'll help me understand quantum mechanics. Because quantum mechanics can't be understood. It can't be understood because, at an intuitive level because we're classical objects. The, the quantum rules just don't work in our world. I mean, they work, they describe our world, but in our, our intuitive world, they don't work. Now, you know, whether Feynman came up with, with these ideas because of some, some quirk of his mental state or not, you can argue a bit. In fact, I, there's an awful, I have to, well, anyway, someone who just said something really stupid in the news today that bothered me about, about Feynman. Um, so you have to try and understand his, his personality. And, and, and the thing that Feynman wanted you to, con the reason I concentrated on a science and the reason I hope this is a book that Feynman would have wanted is to understand his science. I think the reason, in fact, he says it many times, the reason he got to these things is he just tried every different possibility. And that's the point. He worked endlessly and tirelessly trying every different possibility he could come up with until he found one that worked. What made him unique in that regard is not just his tireless ability to, to try all those things, but most people couldn't perform every calculation, couldn't try every possibility. But no matter what possibility existed, he was capable of exploring it. And that's how he, so it, the way he says in his Nobel Prize speech is I just tried to understand the theory from every different way I could try. And, if, and, and, and each way would work in a different way, and each way would give me insight in a different, in a different uh, context. For example, Snell's Law, and he even talked about this. Well, if you think about it, in one sense, it tells you about the property of materials, if you understand the refraction of the materials. If you think about how light bends, it tells you about electromagnetic waves. If you think about the principle of least action, it tells you about something about space and time. They all give the same answers, but each one illuminates a different facet of the physical world. So my impression, and Feynman's certainly explanation of his success, was that he just tried to understand something from many different ways and wasn't afraid of thinking about things in his own way. In fact, it was also somewhat of his downfall because he literally could not, he didn't read other people's papers. And I didn't go into qu superfluidity and the weak interaction and quantum chronodynamics. In each stage, he was at the precipice of doing something else wonderful that would have won another Nobel Prize. But all he had to do was study the work of others and build on it, but not Feynman. He had to do things his own way. And as, as Sidney Coleman, I don't know if I even know him, a wonderful physicist at Harvard who's now deceased, used to say that was the problem. It was Feynman. Feynman, not all the other people are jerks. Sometimes it pays to listen to them. So I'm not sure, what, were, you, were you getting at the, the sense there that there's some sort of strange mental state that, that Feynman... I mean, he was called no ordinary genius by Chris Sykes in the in the. Well, in the, in we're the not book. talking about any mystery. There's, there's a whole there's a whole. This is not going on tape. Okay. You're, you're, there's a whole library. You, you have to have the mic. There's a there is a library of books by a gentleman in Ireland called Fitzgerald, and they're all on the topic of Asperger's and genius. He's a one-topic person, but he managed to sell ten books on that topic. And the people that he mentions are Feynman, Einstein. Nabokov and the rack. Mm -hmm. So I think it isn't, I'm not coming off the top of my head with this. The point is, there's a whole field in psychology that believes this, whether it's true or not. 
I, the one thing so, I, so, so why don't we ask somebody who knows about synesthesia? Rama. Rama Chandra. Uh, well, it's a curious uh, uh, condition where somebody experiences colors when they see numbers, but one form of the condition which is not as widely known is called number form, which is described by Francis Galton in the 19th century, where a person who's otherwise completely normal will say every number, when I, when I ask any one of you here to imagine the numbers 1 to 10, there's a vague sense of 1 being on the left side and 10 being on the right, and all the numbers in between. For these people, it's much more vivid. They actually see the numbers in space, and the 1 will be here, 2 will be here, 3, 4, 5, 6, be all over the place, and form this elaborate convoluted line in space, and nobody's ever studied it. We studied it briefly in about 10 years of Ed Hubbard and I. And uh, one of the things they say repeatedly is that it enables them to do calculations. They say they can see, they can walk around their number line or look around the hidden uh, recesses of the number line that enables them to do internal calculations. The trouble is nobody's proved it objectively. One of the things we want to do. And also, conversely, they say when there are kinks in the line, it makes computations difficult for the kinks. Even something as simple as 17 multiplied by 3, they say it's near the kink. Because huh. it's hard for them. Huh. This is all purely subjective, but we need to try and nail it down. One of the things we suggested was that why do you have these number lines? Because number is an abstract idea, and the concept of sequence and yeah. quantity and mm -hmm. ordinality and cardinality. And you can't create a lookup table in the brain. So what you do is you know, the brain has this strategy of using a pre existing map, a spatial map, to map on numbers. So you, you, instead of using a lookup yeah. table, you, 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 you do it that way. And that enables you to do some sort of computation in some mis mysterious way, which we don't quite understand. But it needs to be studied. Well, thank you. Can I just so add something? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I love listening to him. But um, well, that's the first thing I want to say. I always love listening to you. But, 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 for, but I just want to say that I think that psychologist is full of crap. <laughs> um, not this one. Um, but uh, that um, you know, Feynman. You can look at his calculations, and they're they're, they're not mysterious. I mean, he later on made it, and that's maybe what the, this guy thought that Feynman made it all look like it was magic. Oh, I can come up with the answer. The reason he could answer almost any question people had is that sometime in the notes he'd taken, he'd done the detailed calculation and come up with the answer. He made it appear as if it was magic, but it wasn't. It was hard work and brilliance. It was a combination of the two. So, the, the impression he gave was something very different than the way he actually worked. All right. So we've got two. Uh, two or three people. There's, um, um, I'll get to you in a moment. There's somebody here earlier, and then okay. What was the attraction of Guru and Bhattar? Oh. Well, you know, I mean, uh, well, you know, he won. <laughs> uh, what we, we, I, I forget how to pronounce it. What was the? You know, he wa he wanted to go to this place, which which I can never pronounce the name of it. Ulan Bhattar. and and in fact, Ralph Layton. Uh, who, who is a, 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 a Tuva, in fact, of course, but, but, it, but it was this place called Tuva, and there's a whole book about how they had decided they were going to visit this place, Tuva, at Leighton and, and Feynman, and, and of course, to get there, you had to get special visas, and, and, they, and he never made it there, right? But, uh, but he wanted to, Leighton made it there later, and there's a whole book you can read about it. And I think the attraction was like, well, in fact, you know what? It allows me a perfect segue. You can always turn any question into the answer you want to give. Right, and the answer I give it, I think the attraction was it was some place no one he knew had been before, and I end the book on one of my favorite anecdotes, which is a new one uh, that I got from Barry Barish, who uh, is a professor at Caltech and a good friend of mine and a former colleague of, of Feynman's for many years. They lived together about three miles away in, in, on the same block from Caltech, and every now and then they would walk to Caltech, walk together, and 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 Bar it was wonderful for Barish to have that experience. And one day Feynman said, you know, you, you ever seen that house on the other street? And, and, and Barry realized, of course, when he walked, he always took exactly the same route. Yeah. Feynman made a point of never taking the same path twice. Why don't we um, go over here and see if you, you have a question? Yes. Uh, Richard Feynman is a hero to a very interesting subculture of people. And uh, yeah. it's very counterintuitive, but it's uh, magicians. Yeah. Because of his uh, thoughts on magic and how supportive he was of it and how much he enjoyed it. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Well, well as I said, Feynman was a showman. And he loved to um, make things, make his, well, he loved to do two things. It's kind of, again, a dichotomy. He loved to do things as if they were by magic. So he'd often 
take a complicated problem that no one could figure out and just describe the answer and everyone would be awed by it. And that was led to Murray Gunn Man saying it. But, but really, as I say, it wasn't magic. Just like for a magician, it wasn't magic. I think that's what appealed to him, is to give that magicians work very hard behind the scenes to make something happen that looks like magic. But the, uh, but the thing that Feynman, and, and like some good magicians, my friend James Randi, for example, sometimes they actually explain what they're doing. So Feynman, uh, while he liked to give the uh, apparent, the, the picture that he was coming up with an answer by magic, the other thing that Feynman was, was a teacher. He loved to explain things, and he explained things in the way that he thought about them. And, and, and that's why his, his books are such a treasure, and his lectures are such a treasure. That, that, and, and, and as a, if, to the extent that he influenced me, there are two influences probably. One, to have fun, which I probably got from a student, uh, 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 someone who was a postdoc of his, a guy named Sheldon Glashow, who is now, an, who is now a, no, was a Nobel Prize winner, who was someone I worked with when I was at Harvard, who, and we used to yell at each other in our office, just like he and Murray Gellman would yell at each other, and the idea was to have fun. And so that's one thing. And, and I think the second thing is that I try to do, and, and I learn from him, is that it's really fun to try and take a complicated idea and explain it so people can understand it. And there's nothing more satisfying because only then do you really understand it yourself. And I think that was the point. Only when you've tried to think about something and explain it in a way, not just with the mathematics, but in a way where you really intuitively understand it, do you really understand the concept. And I think he, lo he loved doing that, and, and I guess so do I. Feynman was very supportive of education. So what do you think he would have thought of uh, recent drifts, if you like, losses in the... The, the enlightenment and the, the entropy of ignorance that seems to be surrounding us these days. And, and what do you think we could, we could learn from what he did and, and maybe pull things back to, uh, you know, to get science and the public perception of science back on track? Okay. Well, that's a very good question. Um, well, I think that there are two things that Feynman, Feynman had no tolerance for nonsense in the public arena or anywhere else. And neither do I. I, I think I try to share that trait too. Um, I think it's incredibly damaging to society to tolerate nonsense with uh, impunity. And by nonsense I don't mean just say merely you know being a Republican or something. I mean uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, I couldn't resist. Um, but I mean, so by nonsense, I mean, no yeah, I, do, I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. We, we have a new lo gun law in Arizona, too. I worry about saying that. Um, but I, what I mean by that is nonsense means that which does not agree with experiment. And so, uh, and that we just tolerate it. Not only do we tolerate it, but in fact, unfortunately, the Internet, which is a great source of information, is also a great source of misinformation. But what Feynman would say is that science teaches us, teaches us, to how to deal with nonsense. Yeah, it's a, it's a, he's calling me down from above. Um, he, uh, and he said, he said, in science we learn the way you try to, if you have an idea, you try and prove it right. And then you try and prove it wrong. You try equally hard. And he said, in science you kind of learn a standard integrity and honesty. And so I, what I would, I think, Simon so would say, and I say, I think he'd say that because it's what I would say, is that what we need to do is teach kids the process of discerning sense from nonsense. We don't need to, there's too much emphasis on teaching facts, but not process, and enjoyment of facts. You know, Feynman used to say when he was a kid, he went in the woods and, and, he, and he saw a bird and, and, you know, or a tree, I forget what, and he wanted to, follow, he wanted to know what the name of it was. But the father said, what, what does the name matter? The name of the bird doesn't tell you anything about the bird. It doesn't tell you how it lives, how it dies, how it works, how it... So the na you know, naming things is just irrelevant, but a lot of people love to know the names of things, but it doesn't mean they have knowledge. The knowledge is how things work. As he said, if I cannot create it, I don't understand it. So the thing we need to work harder at is to get kids and adults. And one of the reasons I spend a lot of time talking about science and the process of science is to give people a filter that they can use later on to determine what's sense and nonsense in the public arena. Now the problem, part of the problem, it's easy to say that. It's hard to do. And one of the problems, and it's easier to uh, illustrate the problems than the solutions, but one of the big problems is most of, for example, our middle school science teachers in this country, about 89% of them don't have a science degree. Okay? Now, 
what that means is many of them are uncomfortable teaching science. And I remember when my daughter was in grade two, her teacher was uncomfortable. I mean, she, what do you teach in grade two? It's light during the day, dark at night. I mean, it's not, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. But, uh, but she was uncomfortable, and, and the kids sensed it. And what, I, what, what happens if you're uncomfortable is you tend to teach the curriculum. You tend to teach, you want to have facts that you can test because you don't want to go outside the curriculum because you might not know the answer. We need people who are more comfortable with science because then we can teach kids about the process of science. And I happen to agree with Feynman that I think the process of science is useful far beyond science. It's useful in the public arena. In fact, it's essential for a healthy democracy because telling sense from nonsense is the only way we can determine sound public policy among the public, among the voters, and among legislators. There's a, there's a long section on the Science Network. I ask almost everybody I speak to. Uh, I remind them that when I came into office, President Obama said his administration would restore science to the rightful place. Gave no coordinates. So I was asking people, what's the rightful place of science? Well, you just heard it from me. And that was Francis answer. Um, we actually do need him to get science and books. And, and so maybe one more question? So, so I have a question. Yeah, one more. OK, one more. We, um, these days, we are all riveted by the catastrophe in Japan. Yes. And uh, we all know, we all fear what could happen if there were meltdowns in plants here mm. and all over the world. You have channeled Feynman to some degree. I like so to think so. <laughs> the, the enterprise of science is so exciting and so wonderful and so riveting when you want to get into it. But then, what happens? What happens when it gets out there? What would Feynman say? Oh, God. Well, okay. What was, let, me, let me channel. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, Feynman would say that, I think, and Feynman said this, you know, it, the job of the scientist is to give, is to say how things work. It's not to decide what, not decide policy. Okay? It's to, it's to give the information to the people who we elect to decide policy. But we shouldn't get, as he said, I mean, it's right there. He said, reality takes precedence over public relations. So he would say the challenge of disaster, the public relations of NASA were that the space shuttle was, you know, safe. We now know it has a 1 in 30 chance of, 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 of getting destroyed. Okay? Not unreasonable. Uh, but, but it was, we, how dare we say that because it might indicate people would die. He would say that we have an onus as scientists to expose public relations when it doesn't when it doesn't correspond to reality when it be it in NASA or in the nuclear industry or nuclear weapons I mean I spent a lot of time talking about the nonsense you know Obama had a hard time getting through a treaty a start treaty because of a huge debate about missile defense to make sure we preserve missile defense in the country we don't have missile defense in this country and as a scientist I feel an obligation to explain that we don't have it it's, it's an emperor's new clothes. It doesn't work. Having said that, I think Feynman would have to say that it, I, I suspect Feynman would say that it's perfectly possible to build a safe nuclear power plant. In fact, one interpretation of what happened in Japan is how remarkably safe they are. Because the worst possible catastrophe you could imagine it was stupid design. Let me point this out. And a number of us, in fact, the Bolton of Atomic Scientists has a wonderful issue this month online about these very subjects. And um, one of our people, in fact, uh, uh, I think it was Frank von Hippel, years ago testified it's stupid to build one of these re nuclear reactors on the seashore in Japan where you're going to have a tsunami. First stupid thing. Second, why put the generators on the ground, okay, when you could put them up above, okay? And all of these things were stupid. But then you take the stupidest thing you can do, and yet have a tsunami, you get rid of the power and everything else, and over 10,000 people died in the tsunami, as of yet, no one has died from these nuclear reactors. In the worst possible stupid case you can imagine. People are afraid of radioactivity because they can't see it. But in fact, it's easier to monitor than the soot that's produced by coal plants. But no one minds the soot that's produced by coal plants, which is killing more people than nuclear reactors. Now, am I in favor of nuclear power? Turns out I'm not. But not because of the, of the radioactive dangers. I think those can be controlled and by sensible engineering. I really do. Uh, I'm not afraid of radioactivity because I can monitor it much more effectively than almost anything else. And I don't think it's a problem to store it, ultimately. You put it underground and I, I'm not worried. The real problem to me is economics. 
It just takes too damn long and too much money to build a nuclear power plant. It's a 20-year proposition. In the modern world, that's economically unfeasible. Moreover, it's a lot cheaper, easier to conserve power, conserve energy, and look for other less centralized power sources. So there are a lot of reasons to not focus on nuclear power, but in my mind, it's not the dangers that people think of, and I suspect Feynman would agree with me. Thank you. That was a wonderful evening. Um, can we all just thank Lawrence for this very good